Hello there, I'm Robert Martinez, State Historian of New Mexico, and this is New Mexico History in 10 Minutes. The year is 1695, it's three years into the Reconquista of New Mexico. Vargas had a bloodless reconquest, but then it quickly became bloody. He had to take Santa Fe by force of arms and other pueblos as well. They were not all that keen on accepting Spanish domination. So things had to change. There were battles up at Jemez and other parts of New Mexico uh, that were uh, quite violent. And uh, Vargas executed about 70 uh, Puebloan warriors uh, near the plaza in what's now Santa Fe. So um, things were pretty tense in New Mexico. Um, those colonists that came back with him in 1693 were New Mexican natives. They were part Spanish and part Native American. Uh, but they represented the Spanish population of New Mexico, the, the remnant, you can say. And he also brought Mexico City colonists uh, from uh, various areas such as, well, Mexico City and Puebla. And these were Spanish families, more or less. I've researched a couple of them. And when you start to dig deep, a couple of them have Morisco or Mulato uh, ancestors right there in Mexico City. But this was the group that came up in 1693. And then in 1695, the uh, underling of Diego de Vargas, Juan Paez Hurtado, a Spaniard from Andalusia, Spain, he went to recruit Spanish families at Zacatecas to come up to New Mexico. And uh, the deal was uh, they were supposed to receive uh, 300 pesos, a lot of money, uh, to uh, give them an incentive to come up to New Mexico and settle. Something happened on the way to the treasury. Um, he went to the hacienda to collect the funds, and then uh, Paez Hurtado and his soldiers then went to Zacatecas, and they did something interesting. Um, it was a form of embezzlement where uh, they went to the Casas de Juegos, that would be a casino in our days, and uh, he recruited Spanish people, uh, men, and what he did was he had them sign up for the expedition, and he gave them a bribe, essentially. I don't know how much it was, but, you know, here's $50, here's $100, but in pesos back then, and signed them up and then sent them back on their way to go gamble in the gambling house. Uh, then what he did was he recruited families of uh, mestizos, mulatos, people who are part Spanish, but also part uh, Native American, uh, to be the actual families that come to New Mexico. Um, and he also did something interesting, kind of strange. He invented families. He took uh, people from this group, and he took people from this other group, and he would create uh, a fake family, and this would be a family that would come up to New Mexico. Well, he also was known to have recruited some um, India's uh, talameras. Uh, I, I like to think that's where we get our tamale tradition. These were tamale makers from Zacatecas, and they come up to New Mexico as well. But this is uh, not good, because what happens is these families, they don't get the full amount of money uh, that uh, colonists were promised. They come up to New Mexico, and these are people that are... Uh, uh, again, half uh, Spanish and half African, half uh, Native American. And there are some Spanish families. Two of the uh, uh, people that help uh, Paez Hurtado in this uh, situation, this scheme, this scam, uh, were Bartolome Lovato, the first Lovato in New Mexico. He was listed as Spanish. And Francisco Montes Vigil, he was uh, the Vigil person that established that family in New Mexico. Um, he has an interesting history, too. We've researched him in Zacatecas. It turns out he was a mulatto himself, though in the documents he's called Spanish, but he was actually uh, part African or part mulatto on his mom's side. So these are uh, our ancestors, and they're coming up here, and they come up in 1695. So what is the aftermath of this situation? Well, we know that Santa Fe is the first Villa. Villa is a town. There were no ciudades in New Mexico. None of the communi communities here were big enough to be a city. 
but Santa Fe was the first via, via of New Mexico. Uh, Guadalupe del Paso, today Juarez, was a mission, so it wasn't a via. That was established in 1659. Well, Vargas wanted a community for these new folks, these folks from Mexico City and the folks coming from Zacatecas. So in 1695, just north of Santa Fe, near what's today Española, he established uh, La Via de Santa, Santa Cruz de la Cañada. That was uh, uh, the Holy Cross town uh, of La Cañada, which is a topographical or geographical term. Um, anyway, this is where these folks settle. And it's quite interesting because uh, I've seen documents where um, they actually petition Vargas a few years later uh, for government assistance because they had not yet learned how to farm. These folks were not farmers. They were merchants. They were artisans, weavers, uh, people from cities, ciudades like Zacatecas in Mexico City. But nonetheless, they also, within a generation, marry in with each other and with the old New Mexico families. Now, before we start to think that everything is peachy keen and uh, post-Reconquest New Mexico, um, we need to mention that in 1696, there was another Pueblo revolt. Uh, 14 of the Pueblos revolted against the Spanish to try to remove them again, and about five uh, priests were killed, and between 15 and 20 um, Spanish settlers were also killed. This Pueblo revolt of 1696 did not succeed. It was disorganized, um, it was not well planned, and not everyone was on board, but it tells us something. It tells us that things were not all that great between the Spanish and the Pueblos at this point. Now, we know that Vargas used force, by he took New Mexico by force of arms in uh, 1693, but another thing he did, a clever tactic he did, uh, was he used the uh, Spanish Catholic institution of compadrasco to maneuver himself into the higher levels of the pueblos. Compadrasco is godparenthood, and even more specifically, godfather, a very sacred and uh, religious relationship that is established between people that goes even deeper than family ties. He did this in order to bring the Pueblos under his sphere. So he became the compadre, the godfather. Again, this is a very important relationship in uh, Catholic Mediterranean culture in places like Sicily and southern Spain. Well, that's what he did in New Mexico. So we see this going on in the late uh, 1690s and early 1700s with Vargas and the higher level families of the different pueblos of New Mexico. So what about that scheme, that scam uh, with Paez Hurtado and those families that came up from uh, Zacatecas? Well, guess what? There are pages and pages of documents that recount an investigation that was done of Vargas and his handling of the reconquest and recolonization of New Mexico. He was actually jailed for a period while the investigation went on and uh, testimony was taken by Juan Paez Hurtado, um, by other people involved, such as Bartolomé Lovato and Francisco Montes Vigil, and all those families that came up from Zacatecas with names like Armijo and other families that we all descend from. Well, it's interesting to see that the colonists in their testimony, they don't paint a very good picture of Vargas or Paez Hurtado. They claim they were abused uh, during the uh, journey uh, from Mexico to New Mexico, that they were forced to eat, to eat um, hierbas, hediondas, that would just mean rotten plants or weeds, and that when they would butcher an animal to feed people, that the uh, leaders of the uh, expedition, they got all the good cuts of meat, and the colonists were th literally thrown bones to survive on. So um, that comes to light, as well as um, 
the issue with the funds. And so this is a, a, a huge thing in New Mexico in the late 1690s and the early 1700s. So it just goes to show you that these are human beings uh, doing human things. It's not just uh, shiny uh, leaders or colonists. They're human beings who were going through uh, difficult times. Uh, they were very brave, but they were also suffering a bit and having to deal with corrupt government officials and promises being made that were not fulfilled. So I want us to think about this because this is uh, the Reconquista, the reconquest of New Mexico. And it shows us that, yes, we're going to see into the 1700s that there's kind of a, an uneasy agreement between Spanish and Pueblo people to get along. But there's also still friction. The, the priests still want to eradicate Puebloan spirituality and religious practices. And yet there's this new um, era of tolerance we'll see over the next hundred years where uh, the local Catholic religion with the Hispanics becomes shot through with Puebloan ideas and practices and the Hispanic uh, ideas of superstition start to blend with Puebloan ideas and it becomes a real mix. It's, it's very fascinating, but this is uh, the um, embryonic beginning of what we call today Hispanic New Mexico and Puebloan New Mexico. And we'll also see that um, there will be a new uh, group of people added to the Spanish caste system that will also be a part of New Mexico. But that's for a later episode edition of New Mexico History in 10 Minutes. So thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time. Adios.